Welcome to First Words, a podcast presented by the First United Methodist Church of Florence. Today's message is brought to you by Senior Pastor Rev. Dale Cohen. No Greater Love, Part 4. Welcome to the First Words podcast. I'm Dale Cohen, Senior Pastor, and we're concluding our series on No Greater Love today. And today's theme is Clear Vision Leads to Extravagant Generosity going to be using a reading from Mark's Gospel, the 8th chapter, verses 22 through 25, and let me share that with you now. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village, and when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, sometimes good enough is the enemy of achieving what's possible. I don't know why, but some of the most disheartening words to me are, Well, that's good enough. It's not that good enough is necessarily a bad thing. In certain circumstances, chasing perfection is unnecessary and probably a poor use of our time. For instance, sometimes just loading the dirty dishes into the dishwasher is good enough, even though the plates and bowls aren't explicitly placed on the rack according to someone else's standard of perfection. Not that I have any experience with that situation. The problem with good enough starts when this attitude extends beyond trivial matters, like dishwashers, and into areas of far greater importance. In his book, Good to Great, Jim Collins said, Good is the enemy of great, and that is one of the key reasons why we have so little that becomes great. We don't have great schools, principally because we have good schools. We don't have great government, principally because we have good government. Few people attain great lives, in large part because it is just so easy to settle for a good life. I'm afraid it's true about our churches, too. We're willing to settle for good enough at the expense of having great churches. Until we're no longer ready to settle for less than what's possible, both with our lives and with our church, we'll lead uninspiring lives with minimal impact. On the surface, our scripture for today is about a man from Bethsaida who is blind. His blindness wasn't from birth because when his sight was partially restored, he said he could see people who looked like trees, indicating that he knew what both people and trees looked like. I describe the man as complacent because his friends bring him to Jesus and plead with him to touch their friend who is blind. The text doesn't indicate that he had asked his friends to take him to Jesus. So it was the faith of his friends who put him there with Jesus, and it was their request to which Jesus responded. Jesus takes the man by the hand and walks him out of town, where he presumably spits into his hands and then rubs the saliva on the man's eyes. Jesus asks him if he can see anything. I can imagine the Middle Eastern sun was brightly shining, making it difficult for the man's eyes to adjust, so he told Jesus he saw people who looked like walking trees. So Jesus placed his hands over the man's eyes again. As soon as Jesus withdrew his hands, the man squinted, well, the scripture says he looked intently, and he realized he could see everything clearly, his sight was fully restored. When I started retelling this story, I said, on the surface, this passage is about a man from Bethsaida who is blind. So then, what lies beneath the surface? At the beginning of Mark chapter 8, we find the story of Jesus feeding 4,000 people with only seven loaves of bread and a few fish, and then there are seven baskets of leftovers. Jesus and his disciples sail to Dalmanutha. 
they encounter some skeptical scribes and Pharisees looking for a sign that Jesus comes from God before the disciples and Jesus head back across the Sea of Galilee. The disciples are hungry, but they have no bread to eat. And Mark records it this way. Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said to him, Seven. Then he said to them, Do you not yet understand? It's on the heels of this experience that they enter Bethsaida and encounter the man who is blind. Bethsaida happens to be the hometown of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. The name Bethsaida means village of fishers. On the surface, the healing of the blind man from Bethsaida is about some guy brought by his friends to Jesus. But on a deeper level, it's about the ones Jesus called to be fishers of men who are blind to the potential right before their eyes. They're no different than the scribes and Pharisees who can't see the Son of God who is right in front of them. They need healing to see the possibility of what God wants to do through them. Immediately after Jesus heals the man, the story continues. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. This passage represents what Peter saw after the first time Jesus placed his hands on his eyes. He can declare Jesus as the Messiah, but his understanding of the Messiah is flawed. He believes Jesus as Messiah will be the conqueror who destroys their enemies and sets them free from oppression. Peter's Messiah brings political salvation, but not a spiritual transformation. So Jesus offers his explanation of what the Messiah is. The scripture says, Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Well, Peter needs a second touch. So Jesus metaphorically places his hands over his followers' eyes as he says this, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Jesus tells his disciples they've been pursuing the wrong dreams. They've misplaced their faith in things that cannot satisfy. They have settled for less than what's possible. Life in the kingdom of God is very different than life in this world. We too have been setting our minds on human things and not on divine things. We too have sought to save ourselves with material and political security, failing to recognize what's possible if we see Jesus in all his glory. Jesus wants us to use our influence and our resources in such a way that we usher in the reign of God, whose kingdom is built on love, grace, and generosity. 
I would say that we need to have our vision restored if we want to accomplish all that God has in store for us. So let's see a picture of what's possible for us with God. In our church, we operate from a mission statement and a vision statement. A mission statement defines what we do, our objectives, and how we will reach these objectives. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. A vision statement details where we aspire to go and who we are becoming. Our vision is to offer creative experiences that lead people to inspiring encounters with God, meaningful engagement with each other, and lifelong transformation. Our vision serves as a roadmap and an inspiring reminder of what we're working to achieve. We want to be a church with creative and exciting worship services that invite people to experience God's presence in powerful ways. We want to be a place where people can connect in ways that help them grow into the people they want to become. We want anyone involved in this congregation to experience whatever transformations are necessary for them to live the best life possible. We want to help people live in healthier relationships with God and with each other. It's easy to lose sight of this vision when we're bombarded with the day-to-day challenges that demand our time, energy, and attention. It's easy to settle for less when we're pulled in so many different directions that we just want to get to the end of the day or the end of the week. But our God is not a God who settles for less. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says this, We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. As it is written, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, these are the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. God wants to do great things through us, something we haven't been able to conceive of yet, but still something that God wants to bless if we're willing to step out in faith, not just to do good enough, but to do great things for God. If we resist the trap of good enough, the payoff for not settling is tremendous. When we commit with 100% focus and energy to achieving what's possible, we become an irresistible force rather than an immovable barrier. We begin to make a difference like never before. And even the people around us sense that something extraordinary is happening, and their curiosity leads them to come and see what God's up to in our church. I think we need to be able to see clearly so that we can give extravagantly. I believe we can be a church known in this community for helping people live their best possible lives. Our children's ministry is revitalizing with Mariana and her team offering more opportunities for our kids to experience God's love and move into a deeper relationship with him. Our youth ministry has nearly tripled in size as our young people bring their friends to share in the activities Mac and her team provide to help them navigate the challenges of growing up in a diverse and complicated world. Our Wednesday evening studies with Terry and his team of teachers give people practical tools to understand how to respond to our ever-changing world. We've expanded our missions to include participation in the St. Francis Project, a ministry designed to add resources to other organizations in the area that are doing good things already. Adding the live stream and podcast of the worship service each week is a shift to something new. All of this happened amid a global pandemic in which we stopped meeting on site for nearly a year. So if God can do that during a pandemic, imagine what God can do as we move into the next phase of our ministry. Here's what I'm asking you to do. You know, we could determine that what we're currently doing is good enough, 
but we'd be settling for less than what God could do through us if we were willing to invest more of ourselves. So I'm asking you to resist that urge and to trust that God wants to do so much more through us than we can currently see. I'm asking you to invest in our ministry with the eyes of faith, eyes that demonstrate your belief that God has great things in store for us and you want to be a part of the miracle. As we approach our 200th anniversary, in which we'll celebrate our fruitful history, I firmly believe our best years are still ahead of us. So may God touch our eyes so that we can clearly see the opportunity before us. And may what we see inspire us to extravagant generosity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to thank you for tuning in today, and I hope and pray that if there's uh, any way that we can be of service to you, that you will let us know, and we would love to hear from you, to know that you're listening in on these podcasts, and offer any suggestions that you might have for how we might make them better uh, for you on your spiritual journey. Thanks again, and have a great day. Thank you for listening to First Words. For information about our services or how to get involved in the community, visit us at fumcflorence.org and on facebook.com slash florencefumc.org.